pray that you are not brother one in the spirit. For God, did he bring forth the message that we need today? Be with us, God, keep us, protect us, provide for us. We do that. We ask it all in the glory of the Holy Name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. As we turn to the book of Psalm, uh, chapter 73, let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered why it seems that the people that are prospering in this world, right, are those who have no respect for God or His ways? Has it ever graded you that those who are trying to obediently be obedient to God and live a life in right standing with Him seem to have the most difficulties while those who could care less about their relationship with God seem to get all the breaks, all the prosperity, right? Have you ever been passed up for promotions at work because of your convictions as a Christian only to know that the person getting the promotion was just a scoundrel and a character. Have you ever wondered why do the wicked prosper, Lord? Well, a poet and a songwriter named Asaph experienced this inner conflict and struggle and we get to read this poetry and discover God's truth about why the wicked seem to have it all in this world. Psalm 73 is a psalm of lament and declaration, as is all the poetry of the Bible. Poets speak using the word picture and imagery. They contrast things and use a simile and, or, and a metaphor to make their point. This is a descriptive psalm, and we share in Asaph's inner struggle, conflict, and turmoil. We, in fact, enter into Asaph's dialogue of thought when you read the psalms. Take time to really meditate on each line of scripture. Don't just gloss over it, trying to rush through the scriptures just to uh, just get one done. Really read each scripture one by one, line by line, and meditate on God's word. You see, biblical poetry is meant to be pondered upon. When a writer compares a feeling or describes something uh, meant, something next to something in nature or an object, think this over, for it will reflect a true comparison from life itself. In the psalm, Asaph looks out and reasons what he sees and finds no comfort in what he sees. He looks within for answers and still no comfort. Then he looks up and discovers meaning when he looks up to God. Let's take a look at Psalm 73 and start with verse 1. Amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 1 says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as often directly state the theme of their writers. The simplicity of Psalm 73's theme should not be overlooked. Simply stated is this, God shows His goodness to the upright. Amen. Verse 2 says, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Asaph compares himself with those who are, in, are clean in heart, but he also goes on to confess his inner struggle was going on inside. So what is an inner struggle? He uses a metaphor describing the heart of the pure in contrast in his own attitudes. He says, my feet, his own walk with God. He had almost lost his confidence in God. 
He felt close to the edge of the cliff, and we can almost visualize the pebbles and stones making their ascent as he is near to the precipice of his despair. Here's the application. Often when the perceptions of our heart are wrong, our feet are soon to follow our folly, right? We make mistakes, right? Because we make things uh, that are little, we make it big, right? We, we start getting in despair. We start, uh, we begin to uh, imagine these things, right? And when it, from the things that we imagine, we follow suit, right? We think that is true. Amen. And because we think that is true, even though it's a folly, it, it, we begin to walk on a sheet of ice, envious at the foolish, when I saw the, of the wicked, verse says. Verse 3 says. The, the psalmist here gives the primary reason for his inner struggle. He began to be envious of those around him. Amen. His eyes were fixed too much on one thing. He looked at the present and forgot the future. Envy became the root source of his lament. And so in verses 4 through 7, he begins to contrast and compare the godly to the ungodly. Verse 4 says, he wrote, For there are no bands in the inner death, in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued as like other men. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more heart could wish. Next to the common man, brothers and sisters, the ungodly seem to live a, a painless life and even remain healthier. Common troubles such as financial security, adequate health care, uh, and shelter do not, do not trouble them the well-to-do. Asaph speaks in a metaphor when he describes the arrogance of some of these types of people. Their, their pride and arrogance is like a jeweled necklace, flashy and showy before others. Asaph's second metaphor describes these two uh, these people's intentions as cruel. How how are those how are clothes woven in the days of the Bible? It would take a long time to weave a garment by hand. Just so the intentions of some people are cruel and often plotting and purposeful. Do you see how this point begins? To describe things using the imagery of life? We can appreciate the poetry of the Bible if we look for its imagery. If we really pay close attention to the scripture. And what Asaph is trying to say and convey here. Asaph then says, hey, these guys have everything. Anything their hearts can wish for. But he uses hyperbole exaggerating or overemphasizing to make his point. No one can have absolutely anything he or she wishes for, no matter how well they, how well off they are, how much money they have. But you know, we can relate, because it sure seems that, that, those, that those who are rich can, right? Verses eight through nine says, that they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Many times the ungodly not only convey an attitude of arrogance, but they propagate their pride. Is Asaph literal, literal in that these people seek to crush others? Perhaps the means of some people crushing others is through the means of the first part of verse 8 by their stopping and speaking right speaking behind your back right spreading rumors about you 
Amen? In other words, there are people in this world that have no respect for authority, not even God's sovereignty over them. The Old Testament picture of God dwelling in the heavens is what Asaph has in mind. And so the proud, the arrogant, and the self-sufficient uh, strut their words throughout the earth. They said, I the reason I I am the reason why I have this money. I am the reason why I have these riches, right? I'm the one that worked hard to earn this money, right? When they give no credit to the Lord who gave them those riches. Amen. Verses 10 through 16 says, Therefore his people return hither, and waters full of cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How do how do we God know? And is their knowledge in them in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. Verse 15 finishes. If I, if I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, I, it was too painful for me. Amen. In closing, what is the result of such arrogance? What effect does this have on the people of God? The people become dismayed and confused, perhaps trying to gain some prosperity, some popularity among the world. You know, so real, so a real hard relevant question is asked that I am sure none of us have ever articulated. Where is God in all of this? Right? Where is God in all of this? Is it for nothing that I am living the Christian life when the wicked seem to be the ones getting all the blessings? The answer is no. The answer is no. It's not for nothing. Right? Because their blessings are temporary. Because their heart is focused on the earthly. And their eyes, their hearts are not on the heavenly. Right? They have an earthly reward, but we have an eternal one. Far more greater, more precious than the than, than, than earthly treasures. Amen? That's why it's for nothing that we struggle. We I know there's believers in Jesus Christ that have that gone through uh, through sicknesses, through trials and tribulations, disunity in the family, right? Children that don't follow God. I'm sure some of us can relate. Right? We provided, and I'm speaking to us believers who are Christian, right? We've done everything that we had to provide a godly environment, but yet our children are not following God. Right? We are we're worried about what's gonna happen next to our children. Amen. We got to remember, brothers and sisters, that that what we have, right, will be what the thief will break in and steal, right? It will rot, right? It's temporary. All the pomp and circumstance that this world offers is temporary, right? So don't fret about it. Don't worry about it, right? You have a more greater eternal glory coming to you in the eternity. Amen? When Jesus comes for his people. Right? You will receive your full salvation. You will receive your reward. You will receive the words from Jesus. Good and faithful servant. Come and receive the, the inheritance that comes that the Father comes has for you. Amen? You see, that is what we are, should be heavenly focused that's what we need to be heavenly focused. Every one of us here. Amen.
Don't be earthly focused, be heavenly focused because that's our eternal home. Right? Heaven is our eternal home. Amen? Amen? What happens here just happens while we're here on earth. It's just temporary. We don't bring none of that stuff home, uh, to, to, the, to the ground with us. Amen? What is, what's important is whether we get to be with God or not. Amen? That's what's important. So I leave that today's message with that question. What's important this Christmas? The eternal reward or the temporary? Right? Heaven or earthly things? This Christmas I want to convey and emphasize that we should be looking up these times that we're living in and focus on the heavenly things. Right? Focus on the reward right? That will come. That is of eternal significance. That's far more greater than the earthly stuff that happens that we receive here on earth. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Let us please stand this morning. Amen. I would like to open the altar of prayer this morning. I would like to uh, I'll give you the opportunity to come to the altar of prayer to seek God to help you to walk with Him not to fret about the things that are going on around us but to focus on the eternal to focus on the things of God. Amen. To not worry about other people, right? Other people that may have more than you do financially, right? But focus on and focus your heart on what's at stake, right? Your eternity. Focus on what God has, what Jesus is building and preparing in heaven for you. Right? Amen? Let us bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for, for allowing us to be here, oh God. Father, help us this Christmas, Father, be totally focused on the eternal things. Because we know that Jesus is preparing a place for each and every one of us who are followers of Jesus Christ. Father, the, the, the rich man may have Many things. They have uh, uh, fancy things, oh God, but we have a blessing. We have a greater eternal blessing. And that is to be with the Lord. To, and that is our eternal reward. And that is to be in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, this Christmas, help us to walk with God with our eyes fixed on high. For our eyes to be focused upward and not downward. Oh God. Father, help us walk with our goal to the, where our goal is Jesus Christ the Lord. He should be the one that we need to be looking up to all the time in this Christmas season, oh God. So that we can walk circumspectly, Father, that, 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 and walk on that road, that narrow road that will lead us to our eternal reward, oh God. Father, I pray, oh God, that you just remove it, uh, any uh, any worries and, and depressions, oh God, and, and, and uh, things that are troubling us, oh God, and help us focus on the things of you, oh God. For us to seek ye first the kingdom of God, to keep our eyes fixed on the sky, for us to keep our eyes fixed on Christ, on the kingdom of God, on the throne of grace. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. On the throne of grace. Seeking and looking towards the future. And not in our current situation, Father. Because it is in our current situation that shakes us, Father. And I ask, Lord, Father, that you not allow us to be shaken by our current circumstance. But to, to help us to keep our eyes fixed on, 
on the prize, on the goal, which is Jesus Christ the Lord. Hallelujah, Father. This Christmas. Thank you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for being here this morning. Uh, uh, I pray that today's message uh, blessed you. As a reminder that we need our, our eyes fixed, right? Keep our eyes fixed on Christ, right? Seeking God first, right? His kingdom, right? And His righteousness. Not our righteousness, right? But on His righteousness, right? And if we do that, everything else that's happening around us will seem unimportant, right? Amen? We need to keep our eyes fixed. Amen? God bless every one of you. God bless those that listen on Facebook Live. I will see you next Sunday here on Church of God of Prophecy. Amen. Praise God.